This lecture covers the second half of the ancient Near Eastern period of art, and we'll start off looking at the Neo-Sumerian period, then move on to the Babylonian period, and then the Assyrian, and finally the Achaemenid Persian period, looking at a few examples of art from each period. Uh, so beginning with the Neo-Sumerian period, we're returning to the area of Sumer, the cities of Sumer become resurgent, the Akkadian dynasty has fallen, and around 2100 BC we see the kings of Ur, or also known as the Third Dynasty, since they're um, resurgent for the third time. Uh, and so this is how we call it the Neo-Sumerian period, and that's how it's referred to in your textbook. Uh, so beginning by looking at a ziggurat temple complex, that uh, this is how it survives today. It's called the Ziggurat at Ur, so it's the Great Ziggurat. It has been extensively restored, especially in the 1980s under Saddam Hussein. Uh, a lot of it was faced with modern brick, so a lot of what you see there is modern day restoration. Unfortunately, the temple on top no longer survives, but you can see in this reconstruction that there would have been four levels, um, a temple on top where offerings could have been received, and uh, perhaps sculptures could have been placed in perpetual worship of the gods. You can see that there's a form of buttressing all along the outside, both in the reconstruction and in the photograph here. Um, this would have supported the walls. The ziggurats are becoming taller and taller over time, and we'll see this continue into the Assyrian period where the ziggurats become even taller. Uh, so just a reminder that there would probably be uh, a very, mu very much a need to create more support as the structures are becoming taller and it also provides uh, a nice visual effect on these wide areas of brick and presumably there would have been processions that could get up, go up these wide stairways these stairways that go in three directions one two three and uh, you can get a sense of the scale and the growth of these ziggurats by looking at this one that has been heavily restored and is currently in modern day Iraq Another work of art that indicates the importance of donating or patronizing these, commissioning these uh, ziggurat temple complexes is the seated statue of Gudea, which also dates to about 2100 BCE. It's made of diorite, a very rare stone. There's not a lot of stone uh, that can be found in the ancient Near East, so it needed to be imported. So this demonstrates Gudea's uh, ability to commission sculptures of this status, this um, type of stone. Remember that we saw diorite with the sculpture of Khafre previously in the Old Kingdom in ancient Egypt. Uh, so this sculpture demonstrates his power and his ability to create sculptures of this type. Uh, it also demonstrates that he is donating a temple to the god Ningirsu. You can see that there are little ridges that stick out indicating this is basically a blueprint for the temple that he's commissioning for the god. And he actually, uh, it's recorded that he had dreams, that he was to uh, make these offerings that the gods wanted him to. And this sculpture uh, is one of many where we see Ningirs, or we see Gudea, excuse me, in kind of this perpetually praying position, or he's making an offering in other sculptures. Uh, he would have originally had a head, uh, it has come off, but in other versions we do see him with his head and with his um, special headpiece on. And Gudea seems to have created a lot of these to put in a variety of temples. Uh, the temples on top of ziggurats were known as these waiting rooms where you were waiting for the gods to appear. So even if you couldn't stay in the temple waiting for the god, you could put a sculpture there uh, so that you could have a, someone, a proxy, someone in your place uh, to be there if the gods were to appear. Moving on to Babylon, so the dynasty of Ur falls and the most powerful ruler of Babylon is Hammurabi. And Hammurabi is known for his law code, his stele that presents a law code. Uh, in a lot of order, you have a, a system of crime and punishment outlined on his law code, as well as a representation of Hammurabi. His empire begins as quite small, so Babylon begins as this relatively small area here, and then begins to expand quite dramatically around the Euphrates by 1750, so by the end of his rule. If we look at his stele, you can see it's another one of these uh, works of art that could be placed in a, in a public location, just like uh, the stele of Naram Sin or the stele of Ianatum that could present someone in a very positive light. So uh, this one, you can see that Hammurabi has a close connection with Shamash, the sun god. And so you can see him. This is Hammurabi here. This is Shamash right here. And we'll zoom in in just a second. And then the law code is down below, which tells us about uh, what the crime and punishments would be. So this is 
uh, one example of an eye for an eye. So if you put out someone's eye, your eye will be put out. If you steal from a temple, remember people are making extensive offerings to these temple complexes, and so if you steal something from a temple, you will be put to death. Um, there are crimes for adultery, there are laws for how a woman's dowry would be handled. So all of this is outlined in the laws down below, which are written in cuneiform script, but in the Akkadian language. If we zoom in, we can see Hammurabi uh, right here. You can see his extensive beard, which we often see very stylized in Near Eastern art, um, possibly a gesture of greeting or speaking. And you can see that Shamash is offering him the tools of an architect, which were tools of leadership. So um, tools for building, tools for developing cities. And Shamash is clearly much larger, a bit more muscular. Uh, if Shamash were to stand, he would really tower over Hammurabi. He is seated, though, on a type of throne. His feet are raised on uh, a footrest. And he's wearing a much more elaborate headpiece, almost um, similar to Naram Sin with all the horns that are incorporated, um, but even more elaborate than Naram Sin, uh, a larger beard, stylized beard, and also we can tell it's Shamash. He has little flames kind of flickering out from his shoulders, so we get a sense uh, that he is indeed the sun god. And one final thing to note is just that there is no intercessor between the two. There's no figure in between them. Um, Hammurabi is suggesting with this stele that he doesn't need an intercessor, that he and Shamash are close enough that he has close enough connection to the divine that he is able to communicate with them on a one-to-one, -one, on a one-on-one -on -one type of interaction. So that definitely uh, speaks highly of Hammurabi. Moving on to the Assyrian period, uh, the Assyrian Empire becomes much larger than the Babylonian and, and the Neo-Sumerian uh, areas of dominance. You can see that uh, by the end of it, it's really dominating this whole area around the Mesopotamian region, but also moving into Egypt. So moving into areas that previous Neo um, or previous Near Eastern dynasties or empires had never reached. Um, so after defeating the warring factions, including the Babylonians, uh, the Assyrians take their name from Asher, which is their city named after the god, so right around here, and then you can just see how it begins to spread and spread in moving both east and west. The Assyrians were known for their extensive citadels. A number of rulers built citadels uh, that had extensive fortifications. They were often raised so that you would have a view and also you would know if anyone was coming. Um, extensive gateways so those who would visit the citadels would move through these gateways. Um, this area out here is where more of the bureaucratic offices for managing the empire would be located. And then up here would be more of the area for audience halls, for throne areas, for uh, the ruler. In this case, it's Sargon II. So this is the citadel of Sargon II in modern-day Khorsabad or uh, earlier or previously called Dersharukin. And you can also see there's a ziggurat included. So um, the essential features are kind of more of these bureaucratic offices, the fortifications, the courtyards where people could gather and wait, and then uh, the audience halls, which were within this area, and then the ziggurat, which you can see has developed from um, kind of the single tiers to the four tiers that we saw in Ur. And then now we see these kind of multiple tiers moving up to a much taller ziggurat complex. Uh, one of the things that was discovered at the Citadel of Sargon were these Lamassu, these uh, figures that essentially guarded the gates and you would have to walk past as you moved into the structure. Presumably they are meant to be intimidating. You can tell they have these extensive stylized beard, human faces, wings, and then also a bull's body. They have five legs, so they look like they're moving forward from the side, but very strong and stoic if you look at them from the front. There's some additional views. You can see how they would work as gateway figures and also the scale of the figures. In these citadels, you would have extensive decoration in quite low relief that would indicate how powerful these rulers were. And one of these kind of propagandistic messages or storylines comes from uh, a low relief sculpture that represents Assurbanipal hunting lions. And this dates all the way to um, 645 to 640 BCE. And you can see him here, he's fighting these lions, and these lions have been left behind. They're kind of finishing one off right here. Um, Assurbanipal looks very determined, and this comes from a, a kind of history of rulers killing animals to protect their people. But in this case, these are lions that have all been gathered together in an organized hunt, uh, and hunting was also a 
kind of a prerogative of the elite and the wealthy. And so Asurbanipal is demonstrating his power by the fact that he can gather all these lions together and uh, kill all of them. And there are many parts to this relief. They would have been picked out in some color, so it would have been much easier to see. I know it's hard to see some of the detail, but here you can see Asurbanipal, the chariot, and then this lion kind of gripping onto his wheel. Another one where you can see how the lions were caged up and then released, and then you can see this one's kind of stalking out, uh, looking quite ferocious. And then here's one that has an arrow in it and presumably losing some blood there. Um, so quite violent in its overall appearance, but gives us a sense of the power of Asurbanipal, his ability as a hunter and a fighter, uh, and also the fact that he is able to presumably protect, protect his people. Um, finally, moving into the Achaemenid Persian period, which was a dominant empire up into the point of when Alexander the Great comes in. Um, this empire is really unprecedented up into this point in the class, where you can see that it's extending into the area of India all the way over to Greece. And now the Achaemenid Persians will be vilified by the Greeks for the fact that they come in and try to invade their uh, territory, which we'll see in a few weeks in class. Uh, so the Achaemenid Persians are dominant for a few hundred years. Um, it starts off with Cyrus the Great, then moving into Darius the First and Xerxes. And Darius and Xerxes are very famous, again, for the ancient Greeks, for the fact that they were coming in and invading. So you can see they're just right up to the border there. Um, we're going to focus in on the palace at Persepolis, this kind of ceremonial palace that's in the area of modern-day Iran. And Persepolis survives in pretty rough shape. You can see it here. Uh, it was sacked by Alexander the Great, either purposefully or it may have been accidentally burned down. There's a number of different ideas. But there were large audience halls, um, presume, especially the Apadana was a large audience hall. Um, there are gateways that mimic the type of Lamassu gateways that we see in the, see in the Assyrian citadels. Uh, there are relief sculptures that show us how everyone in the empire is getting along. Uh, you're taking over a lot of area, or the Achaemenid Persians were taking over a vast area, and so they controlled a lot of different people. And here in the reliefs, you can see that everyone's kind of talking, getting along, holding hands, bringing offerings to the rulers. And we see this from a lot of different areas. And these also would have been picked out in color with more detail, but they are at a higher relief, so it's easier to see what's going on. Uh, and our final key work is just a relief of uh, Darius here seated with his footrest, with his throne, Xerxes ready to take over, demonstrating that the uh, dynasty is strong, that there's someone that's coming after him. Uh, you can see the guards behind him and a figure that is slightly bowing to him. So uh, definitely demonstrating their power, that they were very just. Uh, they are known as very good rulers in order to be able to create an empire of this extent and organize it. They allowed a certain amount of religious freedom, um, which really was not seen previously. Uh, and so as long as you swore allegiance to them as rulers, you were allowed to follow different religions. And so here we see them as looking you know, very large, very strong, very good rulers, um, which is very different than how the Greeks will represent them, as we'll see in a few weeks. Um, so keep this in mind as we move on to a later period in the class.